We like big markets. We never try to create the next Uber. For every Uber out there, there's a thousand ideas that people don't actually want that there's no market for. Business owners, they need to hire. They need to do bookkeeping. It applies to almost all entrepreneurs. Then we try to just take our small percentage of the market, put our own spin on it, usually around customer service and good process and really valuing the customer's time. I think a lot of times you think you're your own customer when you're not. And the customers you're actually targeting are way different than you. They think different than you. They care about different things. And we want to know all of that before we actually get into it. Welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is the show where we share cutting edge strategies on acquiring leads and sales for your business through paid traffic. And I'm so excited today because we're going to learn from a monster entrepreneur. I'm here with Nathan Hirsch, who's a lifelong entrepreneur who focuses on his words, the unsexy or boring parts of entrepreneurship, things like bookkeeping and hiring. Um, He's had a, an exit, which I think is, that's the crown jewel of entrepreneurship is when you can, you can build a business that somebody else is actually willing to buy, which either means you're great or it's the law of the greater fool and you just found somebody dumber than you. But I have a feeling, Nathan, that you're great. Thank you so much for being on Perpetual Traffic. Yeah, thanks so, so much for having me. You're catching me at a crazy time. I got two foster kids staying with us for a week, a baby on the way, a basement being redone, uh, but it's tough to complain. L- life's good. Yeah, nothing could be more important than perpetual traffic, though. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> When's the baby due? Uh, early August or mid-August, so we're filming oh, this man. Uh, July 6th. <laughs> yeah, you're on the goal line, aren't you? Yeah, right at the end. It's starting to get real. Yeah, do you know and do you mind sharing? Is it a boy or a girl? Uh, it is a boy. And have you named, uh, picked a name out? We have picked a name. I don't know if I'm allowed to share it on a podcast. I didn't oh, well then don't. That. Yeah, you can't <laughs> let the cat out of the bag. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> but coming soon. We're excited. That's awesome, man. Good for you. I know I mentioned the pre-roll, but I'm going to do it again just because they're my friends and I'm obnoxious. Um, there's a, a mastermind specifically for fathers called Front Row Dads. And uh, I wish – I joined later into my journey – uh, in fatherhood, but man, what I wouldn't have given to be able to go back and just surround myself with a bunch of dudes. It's just guys that want to be better fathers and husbands. So if you're listening and you're a dad, regardless of the stage of life that you're in, go check out Front Row Dads. Shout out to John Broman. Uh, that's not what we're talking about today, though. Today, Nathan's going to talk to us about his unique hiring process, uh, it, the organic marketing blueprint that scaled his business from 5K to 12 million. I'm reading that right, 12 million gross revenue. Correct. And uh, we're going to chat a little bit about your exit. But first, I'm going to sneak attack you. Are you ready to get snuck attacked? Let's do it. All right. So every guest that we invite on, before we dive deep into the nitty gritty, we ask for a nugget. And the nugget can be something ultra basic and simple in your mind, but something that might not necessarily have occurred to our listeners. So if you have just that tip, trick, hack, best practice, that quick hitter, that's going to take people and make them more efficient, better, faster marketers or business owners. What would it be? So I'm a big fan of minimum viable product. And I feel like I've talked to so many entrepreneurs over the years that once they get $500,000, then they'll start building, then they'll start selling. And my partner, Connor and I were kind of the opposite. When we started drop shipping on Amazon, we tried it out with 20 orders. And if the people complained or less, left us a bad review, we would have just refunded them and moved on to something else. Same thing with free up. We offered some free hours of a VA, got feedback, made sure they liked it before we doubled down and built software with outsource school, launched a course. If they hated it, they would have just refunded them. Um, with Econ Balance, we got initial clients and gave them free bookkeeping and saw, hey, is there a market? Are these people going to actually stick around before we double down and build out this whole business? And there's been ideas that, that haven't worked throughout the years too, but we kind of get in and get out quickly. So for us, we're just big fans of putting a little money into something, seeing if there's actually a market, getting feedback from those initial customers before actually uh, going all in and hiring people and putting money in or, or whatever we're trying to do to, to build the business. Dude, that's not just a nugget. That's a it's a it's a it's a master class of thought that needs to be integrated in every CMO, director of marketing, CEO, business owner, entrepreneur. Because the 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 class that people are put through, the business school class, right, is oh, you you plan everything out, you build this major infrastructure in your mind, uh, you architect it, you have your business plan, and 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 then you go and you execute. And the problem is, is you build a thirty story building. 
and then find out that the first floor ceilings are 10 inches too low. And now I got to knock the whole damn thing down so I can raise the first floor. Like just get messy, ready, fire, aim, build as you go. I love that nugget. That's awesome, man. And I counted four successful startups. Did I get that right? Yeah, we had uh, free up. Well, yeah, we had an Amazon business that was successful in the way that it we sold twenty five million over six years. It was a major cash flow machine, but we never really sold it. Amazon became harder, and we ended up um, just dissolving it. But we have free up. We have outsource school, and then our two bookkeeping brands: Econ Balance and Accounts Balance. Yeah, dude, so you're a killer. I mean, everybody, I, I, I a broken clock can be right twice a day, as they say, and so. Uh, when I see somebody who's done it over and over and over again, I get one really envious, but two, just really like impressed. Uh, you obviously see the lanes. How are you choosing these opportunities? What are the, what are the things I know you said in, in your bio, you're like, I like, uh, what, what did you say? Unsexier, boring parts of entrepreneurship, but that can't be all like, how is it that you're figuring out where you're going to go next? Yeah. So we have certain criteria that, that we like in a business and we, a lot of it's just brainstorming. And my partner will come over to my house and we'll sit in the backyard and throw a football around and brainstorm business ideas. But we like big markets. We never try to create the next Uber for, for every Uber out there. There's a thousand ideas that, that people don't actually want that there's no market for. So, I mean, business owners, they need to hire, they need to do bookkeeping. It applies to almost all entrepreneurs. And then we try to just take our small percentage of the market, put our own spin on it, usually around customer service and good process and really valuing the customer's time. Um, we like reoccurring revenue customers that stick around. We don't want a business uh, selling Shopify stores where you're building at one time and then you're always chasing uh, new clients. Um, and we want something that we think will be around in 30 years. In my mind, bookkeeping will be around in 30 years. I don't know if that's true, but we, we like businesses like that where the industry just isn't always changing and we try to avoid fads and like the whatever the latest thing is. So those are just a few things we look for. And then it's kind of brainstorming and market research. Uh, we like to talk to ideal customers. Like when we launched Ecom Balance, which is our, our monthly bookkeeping service for e-commerce sellers, we interviewed 100 e-commerce sellers and we said, hey, can you name us five competitors? What do you like about your past bookkeepers? What do you not like? Um, what softwares are you using? Stuff like that so that we actually know what we're getting into because I think a lot of times you think you're your own customer uh, when you're not. And the customers you're actually targeting are way different than you. They think different than you. They care about different things. And we want to know all of that before we actually get into it. Hey, that, so I loved everything that you just said. One thing I want to focus on specifically, because it's something I'm passionate about too, is the recurring revenue component. Uh, I have uh, a list of non-negotiables for any entity I'm involved in. And unless we're talking major high ticket, um, and even then I'm just like, nah, because traffic is so expensive. Customer acquisition is so expensive. If you're not doing something from a recurring perspective, I think you're, you're, you have a flawed model and hopefully I'm not being, you know, too aggressive with our listeners, but I would like to encourage everybody who's listening, find a way to build continuity into your business. And it's, it, it doesn't mean that that needs to be the core of your business. You know, like if you sell a house, maybe you can also get involved in, home warranty or, you know, or you could start with home services or like if you're selling the great big thing, that's okay. But then turn right back around and, you know, you're selling a, a SaaS product or a software application. Um, and, and you'll, you'll start to see that SaaS has a 30 X valuation, 30, three, zero. And it's because of the recurring revenue component. Whereas, you know, things like uh, professional services, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe. So I don't know. Writings on the wall there. I want to learn how you took free up from 5K to 12 million, which is what we're going to dive into right after this quick break. I'm here with Nathan Hirsch, serial entrepreneur. Um, I, and you know, dude, I don't know that I've met many people that can talk as fast as I can talk. <laughs> like you're, you're there. 
and you and I would you're be talking before, you're like, hey, we got an hour. They're usually 40 minutes. I'm like, hmm, both of us are fast talkers. I don't know how long we're, yeah. we're going to go. But we we'll get try four to hours of the podcast material in 40 minutes is what we're right. going to do. That's the yeah. goal. Yeah. Perpetual traffic listeners getting their money worth today. So a um, couple of things I'm really excited to learn from you. You own outsource schools, so you're going to teach us your unique VA hiring process, which, by the way, I also have a unique hiring process. And I bet you yours is better than mine, so I'm going to steal the components of yours that I like and then pretend I came up with it. Um, <laughs> just kidding. But before we get into that, talk to us about your organic marketing blueprint that scaled free up from 5K to 12 million. Yeah. So to kind of put it in perspective, I, we sold on Amazon for six, seven years, and this was even before Amazon PPC. So we would list products on Amazon and Amazon would get us the customers and we would sell products that way. And when we launched free up and we got it off the ground, minimum viable product, like we talked about, uh, started offering people VAs and they liked the experience and they started billing through us. Then we had to learn marketing from the ground up. We knew nothing about marketing, nothing about B2B. And we built our own website and slowly kind of came across the, the pillars that have become our organic marketing blueprint that we do the same thing in all our companies, outsource school, econ balance, accounts balance, any company that we start going forward, these are the pillars of. So the first thing is an affiliate program. So with free up, we said, hey, we'll give you 50 cents for every hour build for someone you refer to us forever. And we look at our competitors' affiliate programs, Upwork, Fiverr, the big public companies in the space. They didn't really have good ones or they were one-time payments. So we said, hey, we're going to offer reoccurring revenue to anyone that promotes us. And not only that, we're going to tell every single person about it. Um, if we get on a sales call with someone, hey, by the way, before I let you go, one last thing, we have this great referral program. Here it is. If you tell other people about us and we would train all our salespeople to do the same thing whenever we talk to a partner, an influencer. And that was kind of the, the basis. And I remember being at, at free up in year one and getting a, a message from someone there like, hey, I was at a conference in China and someone told me about free up. And in my mind, I'm like, that's awesome. I've never been to China. People are talking about me um, in another place. And that's kind of the, the pillar of everything that you're going to use for anything that, that you do. From there, it's content and SEO. We're always pumping out content. The blog is the first thing we get going on on any company that, that we start. Uh, it's definitely the long game. It's something that my business partner specializes in, not me, but we're trying to put out really good content uh, consistently every single week from the moment that we uh, put out the company. And I know he does a lot of research into what the competitors are doing and, and what other content's out in the space, keywords, stuff like that. Um, next, we get to the fun stuff. So we look for partnerships. We want people in the space that have the exact same customers as us, but do something different. So with FreeUp, we offered VAs and freelancers. And this was the time of all these Amazon software companies, Jungle Scout, Helium 10. We went to all of them and we said, hey, you don't offer virtual assistants and freelancers. We don't offer software. Let's partner. Let's get you in front of our audience. We'll get in front of your audience. Um, it could be an interview. It could be a blog swap. It could be an email blast, which is our favorite. Um, but we're looking to do collaborations with all the partners and we're constantly reaching out to them. We're following up with them. Some of them, they're free to partner with. Some of them that are sponsorships. Um, you can decide if you want to do those or, or not, but we're trying to partner with all the possible relative companies in the space. Off of that, you got influencers. We want all the people that have Facebook groups. If there's a Facebook group of e-commerce sellers, we want to partner them with them. We want to network with them. We want to get to know them. We want them to get the sign up as affiliates. And we're reaching out to influencers every single day. Podcasts like this one. I've been on 700 plus podcasts. When I started this, I had no idea how to uh, speak in front of people, what to talk about, what to do. Uh, but over time, you get better at it. And Podcasts are great for networking and meeting the, the top players in, in your space. They're good for SEO and getting backlinks. It's evergreen content. It's brand awareness. It's getting in front of thousands of people at once. And some of these things kind of go together, right? You might meet an influencer that also has a podcast. You might also have a blog. Like Some of these things go together. Lastly, you got backlinks and reviews. So we're always looking for other blogs with a high-ranking domain. Uh, that we can do a backlink of. And one of the best ways to do that is partner directory. We have a partner directory in all our companies uh, where we'll list our partners there and a lot of other companies will have it too. Easy way to get in there. could be a guest blog post, uh, whatever it is. And then reviews, SiteJabber, Trustpilot. There's other highly ranked review sites um, that we want to ask our customers that they'll leave us a five-star review. So if someone searches e-commerce bookkeeping, they can see all the reviews from our, our clients. And a lot of these go together, right? Like you might connect with an influencer and they also have a podcast. You might 
find someone who wants to be an affiliate and they want to do a guest blog for your blog and you turn that into a really good SEO piece. So that's kind of the the foundation, the pillars of every company that we start. We do it with Outsource School Accounts Balance. Any company we start going forward, that affiliate program, the, the putting out content SEO regularly, partnering with other people in the space, finding influencers, getting on podcasts, consistently getting backlinks and then getting reviews from your clients um, that kind of sets it up. And then anything you do on the paid side really complements that that organic stuff. It's too much, Nathan. I'm going to need you to stop giving so much value so quickly. Uh, yeah. Do you have your own podcast? So I actually had one called Outsourcing and Scaling Show, uh, but it was acquired with free up. So we gave it to them. They took it over. I haven't watched one since. Dude, you have to. Like, my God. First of all, you have so much to say. You're fun to listen to. Um, and I just, I really appreciate the way that you distill information. Like what you just offered up was a couple of podcasts worth of value um, and all little quick hitters. I'm actually having a hard time figuring out which one of those rabbit holes I want to dive down. And I think I'm going to choose the affiliate thing because uh, it felt like the most scalable. And you also treat affiliates different than I've seen other people treat affiliates. I personally hate affiliate programs the way that they're done traditionally. Because one, affiliates are the best marketers in the world, but they're also the meanest, you know, uh, yeah. sharpest teeth. Um, but your affiliate program feels very organic. It's, it's really, it's kind of a, a grassroots referral program. And the fact that you've embedded it in all of your narratives. So, you know, you're talking, it sounds like you're telling customers too, or prospects or um, <laughs> anybody you come across, strategic partners. Hey, by the way, we have this insane offer. And dude, 50 cents an hour is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Like if I refer you one really good client, that could be like ultra tax relevant. If you don't mind me asking, what was the highest paid affiliate? Like how much were they putting away? Yeah. So the last year of free up, I think we paid out $400,000 in affiliate money. So that's a, a lot of 50 cents per hour. Uh, yeah. I want to say the highest person was making like 20 to 30 K a year just off of affiliate money. Um, and yeah, you want to, you want to make it easy for people. So the first thing we do is we build software behind all of our companies. So like free up, there was a portal, clients could log in, but when someone created a client account, the affiliate link was already in there, ready for them to go. They didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to take any action. Same thing for our bookkeeping brands. When you walk, if you sign up as a client, it's there ready for you, um, that you can give out. Now you got to remember, not everyone likes affiliate links. Um, if you are giving an affiliate link, you want to make it look really nice. You don't want it this crazy long link that is really distracting. You want it to be their name, their company in it, make them feel really personal to, to them. And you want to give them options too. So we'll put text in there that says, hey, you can either send someone your affiliate link. You can We can create a custom coupon code for you. So if someone just uses that coupon when they check out, which is very organic, um, we'll make sure you get credit for it. You can introduce them to us via email. Um, or Facebook message, or however you want to introduce a client to us, or you can just tell us after the fact. So if Bob refers Joe and Bob's like, hey, a month ago I referred Joe, we'll backdate it. We'll make sure you get credit for it. We want to pay you affiliate money and all of that. So we kind of make it clear there. And the last thing, which was really awesome, is we'll make someone a custom page. So we'd have freeup.com slash Alex Sharpin. And Alex Sharpin would have his own page with his brand on it, with maybe a quote from him saying why freeup is awesome. And then instead of giving someone an affiliate link or sending them to our website, he could have this own custom page that he could do whatever he wanted with. So those are just a few ways that we kind of try to make it easy and give people different options and really encourage people to promote outside of just mentioning it all the time. We mention it on sales calls. It's in all of our signatures. If any bookkeeper on our team emails a client, it's at the bottom of their signature. Um, it's there on our invoices when we send them. Hey, you know, you can save money off your invoice if you refer people. And just that repetition over and over and over again. What do you? What the, referral fees are you paying for the bookkeepers? Is that recurring too? Yeah. So and we like recurring. So it's fifty dollars a month reoccurring for as long as someone's a client. Um, and the beauty of it is you can also increase it. So we had some really good e-commerce influencers who had huge followings, and we said, hey, instead of fifty cents an hour, we'll give you a dollar per hour just for you, and you make them feel really special. Same thing with e-com balance. We have flexibility there. We could make it seventy-five bucks a month or a hundred bucks a month. Um, you you kind of have that flexibility to to treat those high level influencers or podcasts or whatever it is real well. So just going back again to my broad painting brush and you know ubiquitous truths that are massively annoying. Everybody should have a continuity program somehow, some way. Everybody should have a referral program. 
uh, our my, at Solutions 8, my Google Ads agency, the, the fastest path to growth we found, we found by accident. I got a phone call from a guy named Chris Brewer who owns OMG Commerce, one of the best ad agencies in the world. Uh, Chris and Brett, Brett, shout out to them. And Chris is like, dude, I'm getting all these downstream clients I can't close. If I sent them to you, would you pay me something passive? And I'm like, yeah, of course I will. He was my number one lead acquisition source for like two years. And all of a sudden I realized I should go to all the big agencies and say, hey, I want your trash. I want the lead you can't close. I want, and, and that's, we built our bread and butter was customers that nobody else would take. Uh, you built it in intentionally. I did it by accident. And dude, you said so many things there too that I just thought were so brilliant. The first thing is the affiliate link. I hate sending people gobbledygook affiliate links. It makes me feel predatory. Because you, so you, somebody gets that and it's like, oh, I see what you're doing here. You're just my friend because you want my money. But if you can make it pretty and, and, and I love what you said about the custom page, if you can make it look like they're important. Now I'm kind of incentivized. I'm like, hey, by the way, I've got a really strong relationship with these guys. As a matter of fact, if you book through me, you get a discount or, or whatever. And now you've incentivized me to send this out because you know, you've kind of stroked my ego a little bit. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're kind of like me. I, I don't really like sending affiliate links, but there are people out there that love doing it. They, maybe they yeah. have a blog and they just want to put that link in there and you never really know um, whether people like it or hate it. And we're, we're going after partners. Um, sometimes people that you would think as competitors, and I think you and I operate out of abundance, but in people's mind, competitors, they do make great referrals. We might go to a, a bookkeeping company and they only service higher end clients or they don't do e-commerce or or whatever it is. And, and same thing with free up, we would get um, these VA companies that for whatever reason, they would come across clients that weren't a good fit for them. And they referred to us there. We don't do tax. So we'll send clients to a CPA and they'll send their bookkeepers to us. So a lot of those partnerships, if you set it, think outside of the box and give them that good kickback that's reoccurring where they're making money on a client, even if they turn it down, those turn into really great partnerships. What what tech stack are you using to manage your affiliates? Uh, so we build it all out. So with Outro School, that's the only one we didn't. We used Pay Kickstart, which is a cool little software. Um, but we we build it all out in uh, in Node. Uh, to be honest, that's the part of the company that I hate the most that I don't deal with. My business partner works with our developers, uh, but we always like to build a, a software uh, behind everything that we do. And you used words I didn't understand. You build it in Node. I imagine a smarter person knows what that means. Can you explain it to me? <laughs> I, I actually can't. That's a, that's where my business partner comes in, but it's just a type of uh, coding that. Okay, so that's like a development like, language, yeah. and you have yeah. in-house developers mm-hmm. because you're building in-house tech. And do you do that because it increases the valuation? Yeah, that was a big part of free up. And I mean, when we launched the the free up software, it did very little. Like freelancers could log in and record their hours. Clients could view the hours on their side, and that was it. If someone wanted a freelancer, they would have to email us, call us, Skype us. And then over time, we built in a, a client site up and then a ticketing system where people could put a request and a job board on the back end for the freelancers and the affiliate program in there and billing in there. And then when we went to sell it, um, no one else had our software. No one else was using it. It was a big part of that acquisition. And we do the same thing with our, our bookkeeping branch. We're not trying to build the next QuickBooks because that's crazy and a huge expensive project that's not worth it. But there is a really nice client portal in there that affiliate billing reports, all that stuff goes in and we'll keep adding to over time. And your business partner is a software engineer, it sounds like. No, he actually manages the developers. We have a developer that we've worked with for years back from the, the Amazon days that uh, we, we give him a small percentage of the business and he gets a cut if we sell and um, and he builds all the software with us. And with free up, we hired some devs outside of that. But right now, since this is pretty lean, we're, um, he's doing all the, the dev work. Okay. That's what I wanted to hear. I just wanted to understand the economics of it. Because if you're even even medium-sized business, trying to build your own SaaS product is difficult. But if you found a strategic partner that was willing to work on a participation basis, that really makes things a little bit more accessible. And then they're incentivized to make sure it works too, because he gets something on the come up. Yeah. I mean, it was a great deal for him. He would build right. software part-time for free up. And then we exited. He got a big chunk of cash and he made money along the way. And I mean, developers love developing. He loves building things. He loves trying things. It's kind of a break from um, what he does on the, the day-to-day, which is work for, for Disney and do a lot of their development. So if you can find someone like that, it's only going to help your, your business. And dude, building out your own tech stack, your own proprietary software to increase your valuation is, is brilliant. That was one of the questions. I had 40 some odd unsolicited offers when I made my exit. And what the, the, there were three questions that everybody asked, and that was one of them. 
do you have proprietary tech? And my answer was no. I had some proprietary elements, like our air tables built out all to hell. It might as well have been a custom application. And had I done that, man, I bet you I could have doubled my exit price, I swear to God. But I didn't. I built it in Airtable, and then it looks like Airtable, and Airtable's not mine. I don't own it, and so now I'm just going to hand you the keys. Um, gosh, dude, I'm again going back to that. I'm teeter tottering between uh, envy and mild amount of hero worship right now. Nathan, you're a badass. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I deserve that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> so we've got 5k to 12 million gross. Do you mind me asking, roughly speaking, what your margins were on that 12 million? Yeah, they were in the, the 20 to 25%. Sometimes we would get closer to, to 30, but that's pretty much what we operated at. Yeah, that's hyper efficient. I mean, most agencies are aiming at 15, so you were a lean shop. Yeah, I mean, the beauty of a marketplace, especially when it comes to more service-based stuff that you would think of like writers and stuff like that is you're not actually managing the people, right? Like the problem with scaling agencies a lot of time is managing people is expensive and um, we're, we're kind of taking it that uh, we're, we're working on that with the bookkeeping because we have an internal team that's doing the bookkeeping. Um, but with FreeUp, we'd match you up with a pre-vetted VA, a pre-vetted freelancer. But the the work was between the client and the freelancer. They wouldn't report to us. We weren't managing them, checking in on them. If anything went wrong, we had great customer service. We have the client back. We make it right, get them replaced, whatever. Um, but that allowed it to be very scalable because we had thousands of people on the platform. There's no way we could have managed all those people. Yeah. Uh, we're going to cut for a quick break. Nathan Hirsch, serial entrepreneur and my new best friend. Uh, tell us about your exit. Why Why on earth would you take a, a business to win 12 million a year with the potential to have 30% margins? Like that is the golden goose. Somebody would have to pry that out of my hands. Yeah. So going into 2019, we, we weren't trying to load the thing by the end of the year or anything like that. And to be honest, and this is the advice that we got, the best time to sell a business is when you don't want to or don't have to. Exactly. When you're making money and things are going good and you're growing, you don't want to sell it when you've stalled out or when you're tired or you're exhausted and you want to load it. Um, so in 2019, one of our clients reached out to us, the Hawk, uh, Mark Hardgrove, David Martin, two great entrepreneurs that own a conglomerate of businesses. And they essentially said, hey, we, we like free up. We use free up. We want to get into the VA freelancer space. We don't start businesses. We buy businesses. So would you guys be interested in being acquired? And we we had an initial call with them and they asked some questions, mostly around the, the finances, which we knew our numbers inside and out because we had a monthly finance meeting every single month going back to the, the first month of the company. And they ended up making us an offer. And at the time, obviously it was life-changing money and financial freedom for us, but there were other factors too. I mean, keep in mind, this was pre-COVID. So the economy was at an all-time high. In our mind, we're thinking, all right, this might be a good time to sell there. Um, we wanted to take $500,000 from the sale and, and give it to our team in the Philippines and make sure that they were taken care of. And in our mind, if we turned down this deal and this business, uh, ran, we ran this business in the ground, I'm not sure how we could sleep at night there. Um, we'd gotten it to 12, but getting it to 25 would have taken a lot of changes. We would have had to make a lot of structural changes, a lot of hiring. And sure, that could have gone well, but that could have also lowered our margin and we could have made less money for the next few years as we sorted everything out. Um, on top of that, uh, just being able to kind of work on other projects. And we had come, we had, had this Amazon business that at the beginning, we thought we were going to take down Amazon and be like the next e-commerce giant. And obviously we were young and, and naive at that point, but we kind of ran that in that, that business into the ground because Amazon changed and we kind of saw that market change. So we're at this point where with all the information I gave you, we, we made the best decision possible uh, that we could, and we accepted that the LOI. And from there, the due diligence began. I mean, that was the most stressful six months of my life by oh, far. You're, you're waking up every day saying, hey, is this deal going to go through? What questions are they sending us today? And the, the best advice we ever got was to do due diligence on them, just like they did it on us. So they would fire 30 questions to us. We would fire 30 questions right back. We wanted to know their net worth, how they treated people, their 
plans for free up, their past success, their past failures. We wanted referrals from other companies that they had uh, bought and the people that bought them. And, and all those came back great. And they had one employer of the year in Florida, and like multiple years in a row. So we, we couldn't have sold it to, to better people. And towards the end, I mean, once the lawyers got involved, uh, I think I said this on the other podcast, but for us, it was the, the biggest moment of our life. For our lawyers, it was another Tuesday. They're dealing yeah. with bigger deals than us. They go on vacation. They're trying to protect them. Our lawyers are trying to protect us. So that dragged it out. But six months later, we finally closed and uh, we had to tell our team, which was super emotional, although they appreciated that we made sure their jobs were secure and they got that payment. And uh, yeah, the, re- the rest is history after that. And then COVID hit a few months later. Talk about amazing timing. Um, good for y'all. Just at, you know, out of curiosity, I did something similar. When I made my exit, I, I carved up uh, a tax relevant amount of money and I shared it with my team. But my fear was, because we offered up a pretty significant amount, you offered up a pretty significant amount. Um, so significant, in fact, if you take, especially somebody in the Philippines, I mean, that could satiate their financial needs for some time. How do you golden handcuff them to make sure that you're not screwing over the, the guys that just bought you? Yeah, it actually came up during uh, during due diligence while we were negotiating it out. And uh, they, I mean, they'd been through the rodeo, so they had done stuff like this before. And they proposed a structure where the team didn't get the money up front and they essentially just got it over time. Um, mm-hmm. to go along with like keeping their jobs and, and all of that. So that was kind of our our way there that if they didn't perform or something like that, they didn't get the money. And um, at the same time, you're kind of crossing your fingers and hoping that the the buyers are good people and will honor their word and do everything that you said, um, but ended up working out. And we kind of led up to them. We were like, hey, like we're not selling this company unless people are keeping their jobs and they get this money. Uh, but we're very flexible on how you distribute it and whatever you want to do to protect yourself. Because I mean, we wanted free up to survive. We wanted to get every any of our earn out. We wanted to keep the relationships we had. So we definitely wanted their insight um, on how to do it the, the best way. Don't answer any questions you're not allowed to. But I, you know, it sounds like the deal was some cash, some earn out. Did you keep equity? No, we only. This is other advice that I got that I've given other entrepreneurs. Um, I wanted out. Like if I was going to sell the company, um, which I didn't have to do, but if I was going to sell the company, I wanted to be out of the company. I didn't yeah. want to work for someone else. Um, I wanted to just get the the maximum amount and, and get out and work on other stuff. The original plan was to just travel the world and take a year or two off, although that didn't happen uh, with COVID. But I, I've had friends, I have a buddy who just sold the company way bigger than free app. And he was like, yeah, dude, I'm going to work for this company for two to three years. And I told him like, I don't think you want to do that. And six months later, he called me. He's like, dude, I hate this. this is the worst. I need to renegotiate. I need to get out. Um, when you're working for someone else that comes in with different ideas and business changes that you don't agree with, um, that's just a, a tough place to be. Yeah, that's where I am now. I've got a two-year earnout, and I actually really like the guys I work for. I didn't know that I would because they negotiated tough, but they've been they've been great, to be honest with you. But if it had gone the other way, I'm sure I'd be absolutely miserable. I've been right. given and have given the same advice. If you're going to sell the business, I would carry like 10%. You know, like hold, just like something that would put me on the board, basically, or or make me a passive uh, participant. But you know, so many of these businesses that sell and they want you to, you know, take 60, 70, 80 percent of the purchase price in equity. It's like, well, I'm now I'm gambling on you, man. I gamble on myself. That's what entrepreneurship is. Yeah, and I mean, the other advice that we got, uh, again, I tell people is you got to be okay with the upfront money and not the earnout because yep. once you give control to someone else. They could run into the ground real quick and you might not see any of that. And um, I, I, I know you're in the e-commerce space a little bit, but a lot of these aggregators bought up these e-commerce brands and the terms were very much on the earn outside, very little cash up front. And all these brands got screwed over because the aggregators weren't great at operations. The economy turned and boom, all of a sudden these people sold their babies and didn't get much out of it. And um, yeah, you want to make sure that uh, you're treating the earn out as a bonus thing. No, that's the model. I, I know a guy pretty well who that's the education he sells is how to buy people's business without any cash up front, yep. push all the risk onto them. And he's not shy about saying, and if it doesn't work out, you're not at any risk. You just give it back. And oh goodness, man, I can't even imagine being in that position. Um, how's your threshold for pain if we were to dive into your VA hiring process? Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm excited. What do we yeah, need to so, know? What are the goals? Like, you know, the, the crash course and just being an absolute badass like Nathan Hirsch. 
Yeah. So again, to give a background, because I like giving background. So I'm a 20 year old college kid. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm making a good amount of money selling on the Amazon. My parents tell me I should probably pay taxes. So I meet with an accountant. And the first thing he asked me is, when are you going to hire your first person? And I shrug them off. I'm like, why am I going to do that? It's money out of my pocket. They're going to score my ideas. They're going to hurt my business. I can do this seven days a week forever. And he just laughed in my face and said, hey, you're going to learn this lesson on your own. Well, sure enough, my first busy season comes around and I just get destroyed. Black Friday, Cyber Monday, I'm doing it all by myself. And I work 20 hours a day for six weeks uh, to just get through. And my grades are down. My social life's gone. I get to January and I think to myself, man, I can never do this again. I need to, to hire people. So again, I'm 20. I post a job on Facebook. This guy in my business law class says, hey, I don't know what you do. I need a job. Hire him on the spot without interviewing him. And I get lucky. This is my partner, Connor. We've been working together ever since. I made him my business partner a few yeah, years right. later. But there I am thinking, man, this hiring thing is easy. You post a job, people show up, they make your life easier. And I just proceed to make bad hire after bad hire after bad hire, hiring college kids that did not care about my business. They were smoking weed on the job, drinking on the job. I had to bang on their dorms to, to get them to wake up and, and show up for work. So I kind of realized this isn't a, a good solution. And I didn't think hiring adults was an option in my mind. Like, why would a 40-year-old want to work for a 20-year-old? So a buddy of mine introduced me to a virtual assistant. And at the time, I didn't even know where the Philippines was on the map. I hired my first person from the, the Philippines and just learned a lot over the next few years about their culture and how to communicate with them and, and what I look for in a hire. And from there, we, we kind of built out our hiring process that we've been using for, for I don't even know, 10 years now. And if you think of hiring, you got to break it down into interviewing, onboarding, training, and managing. So with interviewing, we call it our care interview process, communication, attitude, red flags, and experience. So we learned that when you just hire people for experience, a lot of times it doesn't work out. There's other things that you need to care about. So they need to be able to communicate at a high level. The yes, obviously speak English because I only speak English. But they have to be able to understand what you're saying and get on the same page quickly and not go in circles. If I'm communicating with someone on Slack, they need to be able to respond quickly and not waiting five minutes in between response time. They have to be able to use things appropriately. So email me when it should be emailed, Slack when I should be emailed, or Slack when I should be Slack. Um, for attitude, we try to avoid people that only care about money. There's always people out there that can uh, pay your VAs more than you can. So if you're only competing on money, that's a tough place to, to be. We want people who care about growth, who want to be leaders, who care about self-improvement, who read books on the side, who learn just for fun. Those are the kind of people that we look for. And to kind of add one last thing, and I'll let you jump in here, um, red flags. A lot of people, a lot of times when people interview, they're looking for the right answers. I once took a college class on how to BS interviews, essentially. People are, people are good at that. So you want to be looking for the wrong answers. What is someone telling me that shows they don't have the communication that I need in my company, that they don't have the right attitude, they don't have the experience that I need. That's what I'm doing for the interview. And when a rag, red flag comes up, I'm digging into that. I want to find out more before I move forward to the next question. I think people are the most important part of business. Uh, I've, I've said, especially in the agency space, and you and I are more or less in the agency space. I know, you know, in e and agency, um, all you have are the three P's. There's people, programs, and processes. And programs and processes are commoditizable. And so then it just, it centers on people. And I think what most entrepreneurs do wrong is they assume that people are all the same. Kind of like you were talking about 20-year-old Nathan did. 20-year-old uh, Cosman did the exact same thing. It was like, oh, you're a cog. And I'm going to put the cog on the assembly line and you're going to work the way that cogs are supposed to work and it'll be predictable. And I'll just, and, and that wasn't true at all. I found that a good hire was worth a hundred X, a mediocre hire and a bad hire cost me 10 X just not having somebody, mm. you know, there's nothing more expensive than a chief employee. Um, so I love your model. I love the way that you're looking for people. And I love that you obviously have a heart in a, in a, passion for people. And that gets real weird to talk about. You know, it gets a little touchy feely, like we're supposed to be in business here and it's all down to the numbers and what's the bottom line. But really it's like, Hey, how about putting people in a position to grow or to contribute or to feel like they're doing meaningful work. And then when I make an exit, how about I snap off a little piece for mm -hmm. them too? And you're doing all those things, man. And it sounds like you've really been blessed 
because of it. So one, I applaud you. Two, I'm curious, how many people do you currently employ? <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's kind of give perspective. Free up, we had thousands of people on the platform, but our internal team was 30 people when we sold it. Um, Outsource School is pretty lean. It runs with four virtual assistants. Um, and our bookkeeping businesses have about 15 people um, total, maybe 16 or 17, but about that. That's awesome. And mostly in the Philippines still? Yeah, with bookkeeping, we've got some U.S. bookkeepers and, and um, like marketers and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, we have a lot of great bookkeepers out of the Philippines. At this point, we have relationships with so many people in the Philippines that if we need someone, whether it's bookkeeping yeah. or graphic design or whatever, uh, we can get good referrals there. But we, we love hiring from the Philippines. My The tip that I would give the, the listeners is if you're if you're hiring a VA for the first time, you don't want to go out and hire like one person from the Philippines, one person from Pakistan, one person from India. You're just adding a lot of extra work to your plate. There's different communication styles. There's cultures. There's time differences. So if you're going to start hiring a VA, pick one place. And Philippines is, is a great place to start, um, not just cost of living, but also just communication and work ethic and family, which I always love to build family in our businesses. Um, stuff like that. So uh, that, that's definitely a great starting point. Well, do you go to onlinejobs.ph? Where are you posting? Yeah, I know I mean, you have the relationships ISI now, but if I wanted to start, where do I go? Yeah. I mean, the, the big ones are Upwork, Fiverr, Online Jobs, Free Out. Those are the four that, that I would consider. Yeah. Uh, I've had some issues in the Philippines. Um, I've got employees all over. Uh, I'm currently obsessed with Latin America. Um, that was becoming hot. A lot of people have said that to me recently. Dude, it, well, you know, time zone is in alignment, more or less. Um, they've got names that we can pronounce, which I know is true in the Philippines as well. And that sounds like a nuance for a nit, but it's not. And I realize that I'm probably about to get canceled, but I'm speaking as a human <laughs> whose name people can't pronounce. Here's what's really interesting. This is this is a true story. Uh, when me and my business partner's name is John, my name is Kasim. When John and I were starting up and we were trying to get a hold of somebody, do outreach, cold call, direct, whatever. If I called somebody two, three, four times and didn't get a call back, I'd have John call them and then bam, they get a call back. Now, I'm not here to scream like, you know, woke evangelist racism because I don't think that's what that is. I think it's just discomfort. I think it's like, man, I don't really know how to say that. And so, but I know how to say John. And if you put your clients in a position to where it's like, oh yeah, this is, you know, Miguel. That just feels easier and more accessible. So I like Latin America for that reason. Um, they celebrate the same holidays that we do, generally speaking. Uh, you, you have the same you know, benefit from an arbitrage perspective, which is actually a tragedy if you really think about it. That's just because the petrodollar continues to keep everybody else's currency in the toilet. So we're, you know, I won't jump on a libertarian bandwagon, I promise. Um, what did I want to ask you? Here are my issues with the Philippines so far. One, it's really difficult to get people in the Philippines to work U.S. hours, probably because they do have such a strong emphasis on family. Do you just hurdle that or what do you? how do you deal with it? Yeah. So we will only hire someone to work U.S. hours if they've worked it before with success. We don't want to be their trial of, to work mm -hmm. U.S. hours for the first time. Um, that usually doesn't go well. But the, um, the BPO industry is big in the Philippines. A lot of that is working us hours so you will find a lot of people that do it um, i also like to create hybrids if possible like with free up we had 24 7 customer service so we would try to do overlaps where someone would work till noon and then someone else would come out on noon and work the, the rest of, to the nighttime so we'll do a lot of hybrids like that to try to ease into it but in situations that we need someone on us hours we definitely want to make sure they've done it before for years and are really okay with it and to kind of get into onboarding when we set expectations we let people know what the schedule is and give them a chance to back out. Give them a, make sure they're a hundred percent good with it and let them know, Hey, you can't get all trained up and then come to me and tell me the schedule doesn't work. You're not going to have a job anymore. Like this job only works with the schedule. If that's the case, sometimes that's not the case and, and you have more flexibility. There. Uh, second question. Um, the, the Filipino culture in my own personal experience uh, has a tough time with constructive criticism or, <laughs> or communication. So I, I had a, a young lady who still works for me. Uh, her name is Angelia. She's one of my favorite hires of all time. She's our onboarding manager. She's efficient, thoughtful, careful, smart, brilliant. And one day we found out that Angelia was doing the job of two people because we hired Angelia to do onboarding and we started to explode. And she just you know, it was you during Black Friday in your 20s, but Black Friday never ended. And she never told us. She was just <laughs> like, oh, this is the expectation, I guess. And so 
and you know she's breaking her back and i don't even know how it came to light i know she didn't complain but all of a sudden it was like oh dear god angelia needs help how do you deal with like i mean she should have raised her hand and said hey you know this is and so that's one half of the issue the other half of the issue is if i ever do have to offer critical or constructive criticism i notice that it lands so heavy you know, it's just like catastrophically damaging in a lot of ways. So what are you doing about the communication piece? Yeah. So here, here's my tip. And there's more off of that. Like they, they don't, a lot of times they don't want to speak up. They don't want to give feedback, take feedback. If they're managing other people, they won't be, they'll be a little scared to do that. So for us, those initial hires that you make are so important because if you can get those initial hires to become leaders and to buy into feedback and criticism is good and speaking up and, and all of that, then any new person that comes into your company, you with the veteran that's been there that knows how things are done, and th they'll kind of get that new person um, in line, for lack of a better word, um, doing things the, the way that you want. So that's kind of how we approach it. A lot of it's repetition at meetings. Um, like we have our five company values, and part of it is speaking up and don't be a hero and stuff like that. And we'll do these $1 questions where we'll quiz people on what the company values are. So we'll get people that just repeat it over and over in their mind, speak up, give feedback, um, stuff like that. And I guess my last tip, because a lot of people in the US come across, um, I guess, harsher than maybe they intended when they're giving criticism, uh, use emojis. They love emojis. So mm. if I'm starting a conversation, I'm like, hey, Anna, smiley face, what's going on? I got one quick thing for you. And for some reason, that comes across way better than hey, Anna, here's something they did wrong. I need you to do it better. And that small thing where they can see, hey, you're not pissed off. You're not angry. You're all on the same side. Um, that, that goes a long way. <laughs> I had a friend give me a good analogy. Uh, he's from Eastern Europe. But he's been here a long, long time. And he goes, if you want to know how uh, people in the Philippines view Americans, it's how Americans view Eastern Europeans. Because you know, like I, I've got, I've got two Eastern European employees, um, uh, one, who's, I, one who worked for me and one who still does. Uh, his name is Ivan. He's from Ukraine. He lives here now. But Yvonne will just be like, this is all wrong. What you've done here is, is poor and we need to. And, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's so hurtful to me. But that's just the way he communicates. And so I think that we turn back around and we do that again. And it just speaks to the importance of understanding cultural nuance and sensitivities. Dude, you're my new favorite entrepreneur. You're my favorite person to listen to. You have to, it's, it's a crime against entrepreneurial humanity that you don't have a podcast. Or a YouTube channel, dude, or something. Like, get on the ball here, Nathan. We, we put out a, a lot of content. If people yeah. follow my, my partner, Connor Gillivan, or, or me on LinkedIn, we put out a lot of stuff there. And Is that where I got to go? I got to follow you on LinkedIn? Yeah, follow, follow us on LinkedIn. And once I, once I learn how to keep a baby alive, then I'll, I'll consider <laughs> um, starting a podcast. That's so funny. Uh, where can people find you? How can people work with you? Give us the spiel. Yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. I love networking and meeting other entrepreneurs. You can check out Outsource School. We got a ton of free hiring resources there that you can grab and put into your business. If you're looking for a monthly bookkeeping service, check out Accounts Balance. If you're an e-commerce seller, uh, Ecom Balance mentioned this podcast. You get two months free. And um, yeah, I'm on Instagram, on Facebook as well, but LinkedIn is, is the best place. And uh, Nathan at ecombalance.com is my email if, if anyone wants to reach out. And really appreciate you having me on. Dude, appreciate you coming on. If you're listening, we're going to include all the links and resources in the show notes. Um, if you have other thought leaders that you want us to reach out to or interview, let us know. I want to start really leaning into what it is that our listeners are looking for, asking for, need, uh, et cetera. But there's, you know, there's other people like Nathan that can just offer up a wealth of, man, I got to go back and listen to this two, three, four times. Cause I think you did a phenomenal job. Um, for those listening, make sure you subscribe and leave a rating wherever it is that you're listening. Let us know what we can do better at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash better. Follow Ralph who skipped today because I, he had some, uh, I think critical, so I won't make fun of him. Uh, but you can follow Ralph on Twitter at Ralph HB. You can follow me at Kasim Aslam on basically all social channels. Go back and listen to previous episodes. All the resources and show notes are at perpetualtraffic.com. On behalf of me, peace. And Nathan, thank you so much for being here, brother. I appreciate you.